Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very much hope that this video finds you well wherever you are in the world. And once again, please continue to take good care of yourselves during these times. And to continue with a discussion of the recent releases from the Criterion Collection during this year, 2020, please allow me, if I may, to talk with you about the release that was made under spine number 1021. And this is the film from 1936, directed by James Whale. And this is the film Showboat. in 1936, directed by James Whale and starring, among others, Irene Dunn and Alan Jones, Charles Whittinger, Helen Morgan, Hattie McDaniel, and Paul Robeson. This is the very famous, very popular film musical adaptation of Showboat. And this is a work that still remains among uh, many, many fans to be very, very popular, to be quite entertaining, and to include a lot of now iconic uh, songs performed most iconically in this particular version of this particular show, or this particular novel, uh, this particular story, which is Showboat. And so uh, it's great to have it here uh, presented by the Criterion Collection for all of us to enjoy and to experience and to engage with and to try to also to get a, a further uh, appreciation and understanding of the historical context of this film. And I'll get to that in a second when I talk about the supplements. Uh, but as a work itself, is it is still a marvel to behold in terms of as I say, not only the content and the songs and the dance numbers and the, the story that's being presented, but it, it also is a, a, a mix of certain tones and aspects, both technical and in terms of substance. So first is we do have a film that is uh, showing us some really quite technical marvels and, and innovations of camera work and design and so we have here James Whale, uh, who is directing the proceedings. And, and there are some moments that uh, still now are quite marvelous and fantastic in terms of, of lighting and presentation uh, and visual uh, techniques. So uh, this is a, a wonderful example of this, this kind of uh, technical achievement from 1930s Hollywood. And also in terms of a story, uh, this is a film that has a lot of, of moments of melodrama. It has a lot of moments of heightened, uh, of heightened drama, but also, of course, amongst that, or to portray that, we have some really fine performances uh, that are uh, being delivered here. Um, I might add, in particular, there are some fine performances by uh, Helen Morgan, and also, uh, uh, most famously, perhaps, is uh, Paul Robeson, and so, uh, which is uh, uh, quite an, a fascinating aspect in and of itself, uh, which I also try to address uh, in the supplemental sections, or when I'm talking about the supplements here, because his performance is uh, is really uh, it means quite a lot, and it has uh, there are different ways to look at it, and I think uh, uh, just as a general proposition, I would say that it is really, really important, one of, if not the most important uh, parts of this particular version of Showboat. Uh, and there are also some uh, really vivid and remarkable innovations in terms of music, in terms of how uh, the songs are being uh, sung uh, and how they are being composed. And this is taken, of course, from the 
musical adaptation of Showboat, which was originally a novel. Uh, and so we have different elements of that particular source materials that are showing up in this film version of Showboat, which I think is made clear in the supplemental materials as well, which I'll also get to in a moment. Um, so uh, what we have, I think, overall is a film that is still very iconic, very entertaining, very engaging, uh, and is a, a melodrama story that is also a romance story, that is also a serious drama story, uh, that is also a story of lives and generations. Uh, which therefore I think uh, when uh, thinking of it that way still has a lot of potential appeal uh, for popularity even uh, in the today's times which is really fantastic and then there are some aspects of the film which I think might seem to be perhaps a little bit uh, for lack of a better word problematic uh, in any event these are aspects that deserve uh, uh, that deserve scrutiny and that require a certain level of of appreciation or understanding of the historical context uh, in which this particular film version was prepared and other aspects of the production. And so with that in mind, let me now get to the Criterion release itself, which is right here, and the Criterion uh, release supplements. Uh, so this is the Blu-ray of Showboat, which is right here and we have the back right here and this is uh, the release of the new 4k digital restoration of the film and so we have a really wonderful uh, looking presentation which sounds great and so it's, it's really great to have i should point out that criterion did release back in the day a, a number of versions actually of this film on Laserdisc. Here's one of those particular releases. This happens to be Laserdisc Spine number 44. And I'll refer to this a little bit later when I'm talking about the other supplements. But uh, this is to say that it, it looks great, it sounds great, and anyone who is a fan of this film uh, really should get this particular release because it's, it's really quite marvelous for a number of reasons, including the presentation of it. And then when we continue on with the, uh, with the supplements, we have a commentary track. And the commentary track is by, um, is by Miles Kruger. And this is from 1989. And uh, let me now refer again to the Criterion Laserdisc because the commentary track, which we find here and actually elsewhere on the disc, and I'll talk about that in a second, but the commentary track that we find here for the film itself is actually taken from the commentary track which uh, as it originally appeared on this particular Laserdisc. This was from 1989 and so that 1989 commentary track was called an audio essay back in the day is now taken and put on to this now current Blu-ray uh, which is really quite fascinating. Uh, Miles Kruger is very knowledgeable. He is uh, he has a lot of great insights into the production history and uh, the not just the production history of this film but also the background in terms of the novel in terms of the, the Broadway musical which was then uh, in London and uh, along the way of which was in the, in the late 1920s so it was first put on Broadway in 1927 and then around the same time uh, Universal was uh, wanting to make the film adaptation of the novel and then the musical emerged and so Universal then tried to take aspects of the musical and put it into its uh, uh, what ended up being the 1929 film version of the film Showboat with uh, some interesting uh, sound prologue moments and th some of those moments are included as part of the supplements on this disc as well as some excerpts from that 1929 silent version itself and then of course we have 1936 version and then we have other versions as well so um, Miles Kruger's commentary track is very helpful in trying to keep a lot of these uh, details uh, straight in one's mind and also uh, keeping uh, keep, uh, just f trying to follow also some interesting aspects of the uh, production, the design, the performances, uh, certain stories about the cast and crew, etc., uh, James Whale, etc. So uh, it's really great uh, commentary track to have. So this is the commentary track, which, as I say, was taken from the earlier, earlier, earlier Criterion 
Laserdisc release. But that's not all that we have because we also have, as part of the supplements, we have uh, a 20-minute interview with James Curtis. And Mr. Curtis is an expert in James Whale, the director of this film, and also a very, uh, very famous film director. And so we have this 20-minute uh, uh, interview with Mr. Curtis, which is called Remembering James Whale. And this is really nice because it, he's talking about James Whale and his background and his, uh, and his career and also uh, how this film fit into the context of his particular filmography, um, aspects of, of, uh, of James Whale's working with uh, John Mescal, who is the uh, cinematographer on this particular production of Showboat. And this is also very important because, as I was trying to refer to earlier, some of the camera work in this film is uh, quite astonishing and uh, Mr. Curtis goes into some detail about this as well. So this is a really solid, great interview about James Whale and, uh, and his life and his career. So once again, this is Remembering James Whale, a 20-minute interview with Mr. James Curtis. And then we have a 26-minute interview with Professor Shauna L. Redmond, which is called Recognizing Race in Showboat. And this is, I would suggest, very essential viewing. And it's a wonderful supplement that the Criterion Collection has presented here. It is important because Professor Redmond's comments about this particular film and depictions of race in this particular film are very important and key uh, in trying to further understand or appreciate the complexities and perhaps problematic issues that might arise through a contemporary viewing of this particular film today. And I'm speaking specifically to depictions of race, both inherent in the film itself and as portrayed by the filmmakers in this particular production of Showboat, this 1936 production. And so what are some examples of this? So um, as you know, again, I don't want to get into too much detail about the a specific storyline itself, but the story is inherently dealing with race and race relations uh, in a very vivid and quite direct manner. Uh, we have, of course, uh, uh, characters of different races and different backgrounds being portrayed in this film. So that's one aspect. There are also uh, storylines that involve uh, things like miscegenation and uh, how that has a very direct impact on certain characters of the film. And so this is inherent in the story itself. This is, inher this is inherent in the, in the story itself that the film is adapting. And so uh, Professor Redman, I think, goes into very uh, detailed and uh, quite astute commentary when it comes to trying to explain or try to give a fuller context to these aspects that are inherent in the story. Uh, so that's really wonderful about the uh, this particular interview uh, with Professor Redman. So, so she goes into the inherent elements of the story. She also goes into particular aspects of the production that on the one hand might seem to be somewhat insensitive or uh, somewhat um, somewhat racially insensitive in terms, for example, of certain close-ups that are given to certain characters in the film, which, uh, according to Professor Redman, might seem might seem to be seen to uh, augment or highlight a certain quote unquote backwardsness or backwards nature of some of the characters that are portrayed on film. And so Professor Redman is suggesting that this kind of filmmaking or these kinds of moments 
as portrayed by this particular production might be seen to be offensive or somewhat uh, insensitive uh, in terms of depictions of race. And I think she has some really interesting points here uh, in terms of casting the film in a kind of critical light in this particular manner. But she also reminds us of certain aspects, other aspects of the film that are, in terms of the production anyway, that are very uh, that are very um, uh, qu quite um, uh, almost triumphant and this is I think specifically with regard to Paul Robeson and his particular role in this film uh, he plays a, a key role in this film but also he provides some of the uh, or not some of it's probably the most iconic moment or moments in these in this particular film production and I think her discussion of Paul Robeson and his feelings about the production and how he tried to affect the production in certain key ways uh, to the betterment of the film, for example, the use of language uh, that was originally intended in the film, uh, the use of the N-word, for instance, was uh, changed over into maybe less offensive language but still quite offensive perhaps uh, not perhaps but definitely uh, when taken in especially now in, in today's context but the point that she's trying to make of course is that uh, Paul Robeson uh, uh, along with others of course but he was trying to guide along uh, certain aspects of this particular production to try to change it in a way that would make it uh, maybe more uh, how should I put it to make it less uh, to make it, how should I put, to develop it more into a way that would be more palatable. Let me put it that way. There are still uh, certain issues that are still brought up in this uh, final version of the film. Don't get me wrong. And so Professor Redmond does take great care to uh, to explain this to us in a way that is much more uh, eloquent and much more clear and concise than I could ever do so. But the point that I'm trying to make is that she does emphasize the the key influential role of of Paul Ropes and not. Only only in front of the camera, but also behind the camera as well, and in the context of his particular role, of course. And then he, she also talks, uh, of course, with respect to Paul Robeson and, and his relationship with the iconic number Old Man River, and how he his performance is quite. Uh, uh, transformative in the film and it's transformative also because this is something that he took with him in his very uh, very um, uh, famous and his famous career after this film and so uh, I mean he was very famous before this film but now he, he took the song and it made it and he it was his um, and because of course he had associations with the with this particular uh, story and this particular musical before this particular film was released, of course. But uh, my point is that Professor Redman uh, emphasizes the fact that there is a strong relationship between Old Man River and uh, Paul Robeson, and thus, by extension, this film Showboat and Paul Robeson. And so she takes great care to let us know about this. And so I'm, I, I think that this is very, very essential, essential viewing. So this is the uh, this is the uh, interview with Professor Shauna L. Redman, which is called Recognizing Race in Showboat. Next is a 29-minute documentary, which is called Paul Robeson, Tribute to an Artist. And this is directed by Saul J. Turrell from 1979. And this is also a great essential, essential view, now focusing in on... Paul Robeson himself. And this is a, an interesting part of this particular Criterion release. Uh, first of all, I should mention that this particular documentary did emerge in another Criterion release before. For those of you who know Paul Robeson Portraits of the Artist, which is this DVD set which I have here, this is spine number 369 in the collection. So once again, this is the DVD set. One of the discs that's included in this particular DVD set is this, which is spine number 370. This is the Emperor Jones, but also on it is Paul Robeson, Tribute to an Artist, uh, the 29-minute 
1979 documentary, the Soldier Trail documentary, which we now find here on this uh, showboat release as a supplement. However, I should point out that the supplement indicates that this is a newly restored version of this particular 1979 documentary, Paul Ropes in Tribute to an Artist. And I must say that there are some uh, noticeable picture differences, picture quality differences uh, between the DVD presentation and this now newly restored presentation of this 30 minute, uh, 29, 30 minute documentary. The DVD is really, really great. Uh, it's great presentation, don't get me wrong. And so uh, let me just say this DVD set is highly recommended if you haven't gotten it already. But I should say that the presentation, the visual presentation of the documentary itself as we see it as a supplement on this new release of Showboat is really very pretty and it looks great. So it's great to have it as a supplement here. Once again, Paul Ropes in tribute to an artist. Uh, the substance of the documentary itself is also very, very key. As I say, Paul Robeson is one of the most uh, important aspects of this particular film, Showboat, and he has a very uh, significant career. As I say, his career is very significant uh, prior to Showboat and then after Showboat. Uh, and his career is uh, extraordinary and fascinating. He is, uh, the, the documentary goes and shows us how intelligent he was, how uh, wonderfully, uh, how wonderful he was in terms of the deep richness of his voice. But that was always accompanied, of course, by a deep richness of intelligence and a real presence, an aura, a great actor and, 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 and a wonderful uh, sort of uh, uh, a kind of wonderful career that had its ups and had its downs. And so this documentary over the course of its 29 to 30 minutes goes into various highlights of this particular life and this particular career. Really, really great documentary. It talks about, uh, for instance, um, his work as, uh, as an actor on the stage, uh, his work with Shakespeare, for example, uh, starts the documentary. Uh, he's also talking about how intelligent he was. He was well-versed in different languages uh, other than English and he was very knowledgeable about uh, performance and song, and he was also a performer. And he was, this is also when we're talking about his relationship with Showboat and Old Man River, for instance. This uh, documentary also goes into uh, detail, which was also referred to uh, in the earlier Professor Redmond interview on the Criterion Disc, but the documentary then also talks uh, all, more about how uh, his relationship, Paul Robeson's relationship with the song Old Man River adapted and changed over time, which is another fascinating aspect of, of him as a, as a performer and also as a human being, because what this suggests is that this song and the performance of this song, which is, as I say, a key integral part of this particular film, becomes something that uh, in many ways transcends uh, and turns into something new, uh, which we didn't see in the film before. Although one might suggest or one might argue that maybe there are some hints of it in the film already. And that is a kind of political statement. And uh, Paul Robeson turns the performance of the song over the course of, t of time into a kind of political statement. And we see this in how he changes certain lyrics of the song as he's performing it over the course of years. And the, the film, the, uh, the documentary, uh, Paul Ropes and Tribute to an Artist, actually goes into a little bit of detail about this. And so uh, this is another example of the fascinating, uh, the fascinating aspect to this particular gentleman's career and thinking and philosophy and way of life. So this is essential viewing in my opinion. It's wonderful to have it uh, in this version. We've already had we already have it in the Criterion Collection, as I say, in this DVD. But here, as a supplement to this new Blu-ray, it's really wonderful. And as I say, it looks really great in terms of picture quality. And so this is Paul Robeson tribute to an artist. Then we have a an interesting 
glimpse into the 1929 version of Showboat as part of the supplements. Now, the Supplements with regard to the 1929 version of Showboat are divided into two sections. So you go into the menu and you can go into the, this little sub-menu and you can choose one of the two sections. The first is called Prologue and the second is called a Silent Segments. So you click on the Prologue version and what it gives you, it gives you is first a little bit of text into some of the background with respect to this particular 1929 version, what its relationship is with the novel versus its relationship with the musical, the more recent musical at the time, and how the studio was trying to adapt and what it was trying to do, etc., and how the sound prologue came into being because this was a silent film 1929 version was a silent film but then the sound prologue came into being so you can find a nice brief but uh, very uh, informative overview of that at the start of this particular prologue section of the the supplements and then it goes into uh, four of the five numbers that were performed during this sound prologue and so you get uh, you get some great uh, indications of the performances of these songs back in the day so Tess Gardella and Helen Morgan and Jules Bledsoe so they are here and they're performing certain numbers of the song they're on stage and it's usually just one cut or not one cut it's just one shot and it's just uh, the performers performing oftentimes with some dancers in the background or on a stage with a little bit of set uh, decoration. Uh, but this is, an, as I say, an indication of what the so what some of the songs were that would then be uh, woven into the tapestry of the of the, the the work. I mean, they were already there in terms of the musical version, but then they would uh, later be part of this uh, 1930s version. But here we have the 1929 silent films attempt at trying to integrate the songs that were now popularized by the musical version. And the way that it was trying to integrate it was through this sound prologue version. So we're getting uh, a number of the songs uh, according to the, the criterion uh, uh, information four of the five numbers are here and then we have the second subsection of this particular part of the supplements which is called silent segments and this is a these are showing excerpts from the silent film itself and this is interesting for a number of reasons of course this is interesting because we are seeing an earlier film adaptation of this particular work showboat we also see that it is a a silent film which is also very interesting as well and we also get an accompanying audio commentary track again by Miles Kruger so Miles Kruger provided the commentary track for the overall film itself and now we get his commentary track for these uh, this presentation of excerpts from the 1929 silent film adaptation this commentary track cannot be turned off so I try to press the audio button so as far as I can tell I can't turn off the the commentary track so they're there so if you want to enjoy the uh, the silent film excerpts without any commentary track my suggestion is just turn down the volume on your television set or whatever it is you're watching this particular deep blu-ray on and then you can enjoy the 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 uh, the the silent film excerpts without any sound but uh, the miles kruger commentary that accompanies these excerpts i think is very very helpful um, and uh, it's very uh, informative so it's i suggest listening to the commentary track as well if you have the opportunity i should point out that this particular part does come from the Laserdisc of Showboat, uh, the CAV release that I ha which I have here. And so this is, uh, and the Miles Kruger commentary does come with that as well. Um, I do plan on talking about this particular Laserdisc in detail in another video, so in case you're interested I will talk about that in some future date. But uh, just know that the silent segment section uh, Miles Kruger commentary track is taken from the earlier uh, Criterion Laserdisc release. And last but not least, we have two radio adaptations 
which also can be found uh, as they appeared on the earlier Criterion Laserdisc, by the way. But these are two radio adaptations which are also very interesting. One is from March 1939, and the other is from December 1944. So the 1939 radio adaptation is the Campbell Playhouse radio adaptation of Showboat. And this is interesting because it, it's, it's about an hour long and it features Helen Morgan and uh, Margaret Sullivan. Um, and, uh, but it also has an, some interesting aspects to it. First of all, it has uh, Orson Welles, uh, which is a very interesting thing. He, he's, um, he's narrating it and he also plays a key role in the, in the radio adaptation. But also Edna Ferber, Edna Ferber, so if we recall, Edna Ferber uh, wrote the original novel, or the original story that became the source material for the film adaptation and also the musical and then the film musical. And so to, she is making uh, her, she is acting in this radio play um, as Parthi. And so uh, this is very, very interesting uh, for a number of re uh, aspects, but uh, I think in particular because of the appearance of Orson Welles and Edna Ferber. Uh, so this is the Campbell Playhouse 1939 radio adaptation. The second radio adaptation that we have is from 1944, Radio Hall of Fame. And this uh, features, among other people, uh, Alan Jones and Charles uh, Winger. And so uh, this is also very uh, interesting and entertaining as well. So we have the two really interesting, entertaining radio adaptations, which I think are very significant in, uh, in some of the details which I was trying to uh, uh, allude to uh, right now. So uh, again, that rounds out the supplements which we find as part of the Criterion release of Showboat, which we have right here. I should say also that the essay is located or contained within the insert booklet which is part of this particular new blu-ray and i really like the fact that it's a staple booklet i really am a fan of the staple booklets and the essay is of course contained here which uh, has a number of pictures as well which are really lovely the uh, the essay itself is called Rollin' on the River by Gary Giddens. And this essay is uh, quite good because it goes into uh, pretty much every single significant aspect of this particular film from the source material, uh, Edna Ferber, and also the, uh, the, the film version uh, before this particular version, the musical information, uh, and also the film itself, and also some subsequent uh, activities afterwards, as well as certain uh, detailed analysis about uh, certain aspects of the film itself, so uh, the music and also the characterizations, etc. So uh, this is a very useful and informative essay to have. Once again, it is by Gary Giddens called Roland on the River. So this is the release by Criterion of Showboat, and I, I was trying to suggest I think it is a very uh, full-bodied well-rounded release of this film, which I think does have certain issues, especially seen through a contemporary lens, that need to be explained, that need to have certain context afforded to them. And I think the Criterion release does a very good job in trying to provide that context. Once those, uh, those contexts are established, and once we can get a better appreciation of certain, uh, certain specific aspects of this film, I think what we have then ultimately is a film that is still a musical entertainment that is uh, very iconic in many respects, that is um, quite, uh, it is a quite a, 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 a key example of this kind of entertainment from 1930s Hollywood. And so uh, this film and the Criterion release of it is very, uh, it's very good to have. And I think it is uh, uh, Criterion, again, uh, doing such a great job in not only presenting the film well, not only showing what the film was, but also trying to give us explanation and background into the reasons behind certain aspects of the film. And so what we have ultimately is another solid, solid release from the Criterion Collection 
Uh, this time it is of this film, which is on spine 1021. The film is Showboat. Okay, my friends, so that's it for now. And so until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well, and please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Thank you once again for your time, and cheers. Thank you.